Welcome to Travels Free Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're talking about Winston Churchill and a pivotal sequence of events right at the heart of the Second World War. Perhaps no historical figure's reputation has been challenged so much over the past few years as Winston Churchill's. Rather than as the hero of 1940, he's been attacked as the instigator of famine, the suppressor of peaceful protest, and many more things besides. But is this fair? Do these accusations appreciate the times that Churchill lived in? Questions like these lie at the centre of a new book by today's guest, Anthony Tucker-Jones. In his lucid, wide-ranging and brilliantly researched Winston Churchill, Master and Commander, Tucker-Jones seeks to understand Churchill by placing his military successes and disasters in their proper historical contexts. Anthony Tucker-Jones is a British writer, former intelligence officer, and a widely published military expert. In today's episode, he takes me back to a year at the heart of Churchill's story, and at the heart of the Second World War. Anthony Tucker-Jones, thank you very much for your time, and welcome to Travels Through Time, which is our podcast, all about all sorts of different areas of the past. Today, we've got one of the most fascinating subjects of all, and it's a subject who is at the heart of your new book, Churchill, Master and Commander, Winston Churchill at War, 1895 to 1945. Before before we get into Churchill, I thought it'd be quite good if you just introduced yourself, because you've had a very interesting career, and it'd be nice for our listeners to hear a little bit about your background and what brought you to this book. Um, Yes, by all means, Peter, and uh, also thank you very much for having me on. Yes, uh, my background is I had a fairly lengthy career in the in the Ministry of Defence. Um, I've also worked as a freelance journalist in the past, and then um, have had a third career, if you like, uh, writing military history. Um, what inspired me to write Churchill, Mar- um, Churchill, Master and Commander, was actually my previous career because I used to work in Whitehall, in a building called the Old War Office Building, uh, which was built just before the First World War. It was the heart of the British war effort during the First World War. It was used during the Second. But, of course, what caught my attention while I was there was the fact that Churchill, when he was Secretary of State for War, had an office there. And then if you come out the old War Office building, just across the road, is the old Admiralty building. Of course, Churchill, when he was head of the Admiralty, was there. Uh, if you came out the, the old war, as it was known then, it's now, now a, under development as a private hotel. But if you stepped out that building, took a left, went down Whitehall, of course, on the right-hand side, you found the Cabinet War Rooms, which, of course, uh, is where he ran the Second World War. Uh, and likewise, if you go down a bit further, there's Downing Street, which, of course, where he served uh, twice, two, two terms as British Prime Minister. So when I worked in London, I kind of felt Churchill was all around me. And then subsequently, I've, I've written quite a few books on the Second World War. Uh, and Churchill always features, obviously, because he's, he's such a prominent character. But he was never, ever the focus, if you like. You know, they, they tended to be campaign history. So it included all the other key players like Eisenhower and Marshall and Montgomery and Patton and Bradley, you know, all those famous commanders. So I thought it'd be interesting to write a book on Churchill pretty much purely from a military perspective. And sort of the hook line for me on that was his walking with destiny um, statement, you know, when he was... Uh, asked to become Prime Minister in May 1940. He said it felt like as if he was you know, walking with destiny and that his whole life had led up to that, old, that, that point in time. And it made me wonder, was that just spin? Because as we know, um, Churchill was kind of a prototype spin doctor. I mean, he, he, he in part created his own myth with all his writings and his journalism and his, his books and what have you. So I wondered, was that just with him? Did he say that with an eye on history? Or actually, did he mean it? And the more I researched this book, the more I realised, actually, no, he was the right person uh, in the right place at the right time for that job um, because of all the things that he'd experienced throughout his life. And that so that sort of became the starting point for the book. And then what I obviously decided to do was pretty much run from the time when he uh, went to Sandhurst, obviously, to train to become an officer. Uh, up until the point that he lost the general election in July 1945 
just as the Second World War was coming to an end. So you, he is, as you say, he's a, he's a dominating personality and he is omnipresent when you look at the, the, the Second World War. All routes generally lead to Churchill eventually. Was it quite difficult to find, because I suppose that generates in itself a huge amount of in, interest in the many books on Churchill that ensue. Was it difficult for you to find your own Churchill as you were writing this? Or is it something that just rose out of the process of your research? Um, I think I, I kind of had a way that I wanted to approach him. But of course, as as I researched the book, that, that sort of shaped it. And for me, as a historian, the key thing always is context. You know, as I'm sure you're very well aware, Church was, uh, you know, in recent years has taken a, a bit of a battering, his reputation, particularly this side of the Atlantic. Not so much in America and Canada, where he's still held in very, very high regard. So what I wanted to do was some of the more controversial aspects of his life where it was relevant military, because obviously I don't want to stray too much into the politics of it, but where it was military, try and give it some context. So, you know, things like Gallipoli, the Greek campaign, you know, his treatment of India. So the, you know, the Burma campaign and how what went on in India, in India impinged on that. Um, so I, I very much tried to frame his life in the context of the times, because there's this inclination these days to blame him for everything. And you go, well, it, it wasn't just him, you know. Britain was a democracy. Uh, there were government ministers, there were cabinet ministers, there was parliaments and all the checks and balances that we have. So, you know, he wasn't some sort of dictator, which is sort of almost how he's been been painted lately. So I, 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 I tried to inform the reader, why did he make, why did he act in certain ways and why did he take certain decisions? And of course, a lot of that is framed by his experiences when he was younger. So I say the idea was to walk the reader through his early military experiences and how did that inform him in later life? Yeah, it's a really good point that you make there about context being everything. And as you say, he is a maligned character um, quite often these days with this charge sheet against him, which seems to expand by the month. I mean, you you do in ways add to that because you um, write really interestingly about his attitude towards the use of poison gas, mustard gas, and you say it's just something that would make a few people sneeze. Why is everyone worried about it? Why is this any worse than um, maybe like kind of fire, firing artillery at people? So that's a really interesting um, angle. Could you talk about that for a moment, Churchill's attitude towards different types of weaponry? Yes, by all means. I mean, um, when I was again when I was researching the book, this his his enthusiasm for mustard gas came as a bit of a shock and a bit of a revelation. So the challenge there was to try and explain why was he a proponent of it, uh, and that was partly borne out because, of course, he he served in the trenches briefly, uh, but also he was um, minister for munitions during the First World War under under Lloyd George. So he oversaw the manufacture of phosgene and mustard and all the other types of gases they used. But if Churchill saw the casualty figures, certainly with mustard gas, it was designed to be an incapacitant. So the idea was that it would injure enemy soldiers and that would put a burden on their on their, you know, on their medical services, on their, you know, on their first aiders and all that sort of stuff would be distressing for those around. So the idea was it incapacitated people, wasn't designed to kill them. So if he saw the casualty figures, certainly for mustard gas, they, it, its use wasn't fatal that often. And I think that's what informed him later. I mean, obviously now, because of the 1925 Geneva Convention against the use of chemical weapons um, and subsequent things like, you know, Saddam Hussein using them against the Kurds and the Iranians, you know, they are, they are abhorrent weapons. Um, but you do have to say, well, in any war, it's total war and you'll use any means available to win. Um, so there's this sort of hypocritical approach almost to, to civilised war, if you like, that certainly we've carried through from the, the 20th century. So I think that's what informed him. Um, and I was surprised that we all know that he was prepared to use mustard gas against the Germans if they'd ever set foot to, um, you know, on the shores of, of Britain. But he was also prepared to use it in Ireland, uh, which is quite surprising, uh, against the Germans and the IRA if necessary. Uh, he was also prepared to use it in Afghanistan, which uh, I didn't know. But uh, likewise, he was prepared to use it in Iraq. But on these occasions, wiser counsels prevailed and he didn't actually use them. But it's like Iraq, you know, it's gone down in popular mythology that he did, in fact, use uh, mustard gas there. But he didn't. Uh, on most occasions, in the case of India, the India office in London, when it's not a good idea, if we use them on the Afghans, it then sets a really bad you know, precedent for India. So it's not a good idea. Uh, and likewise, in Iraq, the military commander there basically went, you know, the, the resources I have to hand are sufficient. We don't need to resort to those those methods. So, but again, Churchill's been castigated as being some sort of, you know, chemical weapon warmonger, if you like, whereas actually 
he had a sound reason for advocating it. And um, again, I guess based on his experiences in the trenches, he felt in many ways that chemical weapons were more humane than uh, high explosives, you know, which at worst tears a man apart and kills him or maims him hideously and he survives. So Churchill had seen that on the front. So I think, you know, uh, I, I'm not saying that the use of chemical weapons is justified, nor should we use them. I, you know, I think the bans are, is, is a good thing. But you have to try and put yourself into Churchill's mindset to understand where he was coming from. Every time we record one of these episodes, we extend the invitation to everyone who comes on to take us back to a year in, in the past and to kind of have a look at three scenes within that year. So let's let's get going with that format. And it always begins with me asking you the question, if you could go back and have a look at one calendar year in the past, which one would you be tempted to choose? Um, I would select uh, 1943 because it's kind of that pivotal year of the Second World War. Um, you know, up until late 1942, things had not gone terribly well for the Allies. You know, the Americans had had their their victory midway in the Pacific in June 42, but the war was still a long way from one, you know, out there. Uh, and likewise, you know, there was no sign of the Second Front, despite Stalin, you know, vigorously demanding it from Britain and America. And um, likewise, the British took, you know, quite some considerable time to f- defeat the Axis in North Africa. You know, it wasn't until November 42 in the Battle of Al Alamein that things began to to, to tilt, if you like, uh, certainly in the Mediterranean uh, for the Allies. And of course, 43 becomes pivotal because uh, late November 42, you've got the Allied landings in French uh, North Africa. Uh, and you've also got the Eighth Army chasing Rommel out of Libya, which, of course, by early 1943, culminates in the Axis forces being trapped in Tunisia uh, and they're subsequently defeated. So that's a turning point. And also, of course, uh, uh, Tunisia then becomes a stepping stone for Sicily. 1943 is right at the heart of this story. And as you say, there are kind of these pivotal moments within the year. But say, like, as the year began... 1st of January 1943. Does Churchill, like, kind of, let's put this through the personality of him as he's someone that you've been thinking about for a while. Is he beginning that year with a kind of spring in his step? Does he feel that things are going well? I know he's very happy. There's the famous report of him opening the champagne. I'm not sure if it's metaphorically or if, if he actually <coughs> did. Um, when uh, when Pearl Harbor happened and, and the Americans joined um, the, the alliance. But where would he have been, at, say, at the start of the year? He He's pleased because he managed to prevail on the Americans that the Allies should have uh, the Mediterranean first strategy. And the Allies' resources, um, you know, being of 43, end of 42, were not in a position to launch the Second Front, which obviously, which is what Stalin wanted, which would have been an invasion of France, uh, principally, obviously, northern France. They were not in a position to do that. Um, so Churchill got his way in that, obviously, he wanted to safeguard Cairo, Suez and Alexandria by ensuring that the Axis forces in uh, North Africa were defeated. Uh, And the Americans agreed uh, because obviously at that point, Britain was still the senior partner. It had more men under arms. You know, the American war machine was just beginning to to gather real momentum by that point. Of those, I suppose we have that vivid pictures of the GIs turning up in Britain with their chewing gum and their trousers above the ankles. Are they kind of turning up at the start of 1943 yet, or is that still to come? Well, they had, yes. They, they. I mean, the Battle of Atlantic had pretty much gone the Allies' way by that point. So, yes, they're beginning to ship over troops for the build-up. Uh, and obviously some of those troops that came here ended up in, in, in North Africa uh, initially. And there were some concerns that the British troops had landed in Morocco and Algiers, uh, Algeria, the French would have fought. Uh, now, they did fight a bit, not a lot. They did resist the American landings. But maybe the resistance was slightly less because they were at, at sort of odds that they were, they, you know, they were facing the Americans and not the British. So the key thing with all this is, of course, is it was designed as a pincer movement to trap the Axis forces in North Africa. Of course, it didn't go to plan, really, because they didn't extend themselves far enough east. So they didn't land in Tunisia. And likewise, you know, it's a matter of record that Montgomery's pursuit of Rommel after defeating him at Al Alamein was not swift enough. And Rommel managed to get away, managed to withdraw to Tripoli, rescued all his supplies, petrol, ammunition and food stocks there. The Desert Air Force, the RAF, did everything they could to try and stop him. But Montgomery was unable to trap him, which meant, of course, that uh, Rommel was able to slowly withdraw towards the Marath line, the defensive line between Tunisia and and Libya, that the French had built uh, during the 1930s. They were able to withdraw uh, towards that. Likewise, 
Because the Allies didn't land in Tunisia, Hitler took it on himself to seize Tunisia. The Luftwaffe airlifted lots of troops along with the Italians and secured Tunisia, which meant uh, Rommel had a base that he could withdraw on, you know, safe haven, if you like, uh, which meant the war in North Africa actually lasted longer than it really needed to because, you know, the Germans were quick. Uh, I think that's one of the things the Allies always did. They underestimated the rapidity with which the Germans were re- respond to certain situations i mean they were they were very flexible and very adept at um you know turning things around and that's of course what they did in tunisia the luftwaffe lifted all these airlifted all these troops from sicily some really like kind of interesting scenes let's go to your first one which is the 7th of may in 1943 could you tell us what's happening on that day and where we would like to be please well, by early May, um, the Germans and the Italians in Tunisia, they were beginning to give up. Uh, the fight had kind of gone out of them. They'd resisted for a long, long time. And actually, they hadn't run out of food or ammunition or water. They were quite well stocked. It's just their fighting spirit was pretty much broken by that point because Hitler had refused to evacuate them. So you've got nearly a quarter of a million men jammed up in northern Tunisia, still holding out quite successfully. But on the 6th, uh, British 1st Army, which is sort of to the northwest, uh, and British 8th Army, who'd obviously come up through the Marath Line, who were to the southeast, launched an assault on the Germans' defences, which had been anchored on a place called Longstop Hill uh, to the west of uh, the city of Tunis. Uh, and the British broke through. They punched two armour divisions through there. Uh, and within a day, they reached Tunis. Uh, and their advance was so swift that they caught lots of Germans on furlough and on holiday and on leave, actually in the city, unawares. And I'm always fascinated by the accounts of people like Alexander Clifford, uh, Alan Moorhead and Alan Wicker, who were all war correspondents at that time, uh, because they were there. So on the 7th of May, I would love to have been a fly on the wall and been in the jeep with Alan Moorhead as they sort of hurtled up this dusty road towards Tunis, which even then was a, a major city. I mean, it's a big city. It's obviously got a, you know, harbour facilities and all the rest of it. Uh, obviously, the French had developed it uh, during the time that it was under French control. So Alan Moorhead and his colleagues, they, they actually met General Horrocks, uh, I think it's on the 6th or the, or the 7th, and said to him, you know, um, what's happening? And Horrocks informed them that they'd punched through the German defences. There were no German counterattacks. Uh, and the German will to resist just seemed to wilt in front of uh, the British advance. So Moorhead said, well, can we make a run for Tunis? And Horrocks said, pretty much, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but knock yourself out, guys. Uh, if you get yourselves killed, don't blame me, you know. And off they hurtled up this road past all the tanks and, you know, British equipment. And the further they went up, the more they began to pass these sort of weary columns of German Italian soldiers, all heading south, determined to surrender. And they joined some British armour cars who'd got into the city and rolled right into Tunis, which obviously had been the German headquarters, the Italian headquarters, right into the middle of it, to the extent that they drove by Germans in barber shops, you know, with, with shaving foam on their chins, having a shave, uh, Germans sat in the cafes with French women that they were dating, having a, a coffee or a glass of wine, and they just shot straight past them, got to a barn, which they, when they opened it, they found it had 400 British prisoners in, so they liberated them. And, of course, the locals went absolutely mad as well. The French population, the Tunisian population went absolutely mad at being liberated. So there was this huge sense of um, euphoria. It kind of all turned into a parade. I mean, it was highly dangerous because there were still Germans willing to resist. There were snipers dotted around the city. Uh, The British had to bring up tanks, you know, their machine gun buildings and shell them to try and silence them. But on the whole, um, the Germans, they just gave up. You know, they just the, the, the will to carry on fighting had gone whereas previously they'd been really tough opponents. And uh, Alan Wicker, one of his, one of his colleagues, because Wicker was serving in the Army Photographic and Film Unit, one of his colleagues, he took all these photographs of you know, the liberation of Tunis and stuck on his notes that he was very sorry, but he was fairly certain most of the photos were blurred for the simple reason he'd been kissed so much by both men and women who were so pleased to see the British liberating them. I thought you were going to say they were blurred because he was driving so quickly. It's a great <laughs> picture, I suppose, of the, of the you know kind of troops rolling in as people are like kind of in the barber's shop. Yeah, I think in many ways it echoed the subsequent you know liberation of Paris in 1944. Understandably, the prisons went absolutely mad. You know, and quite rightly, then there was drinking and singing and celebrating. And the other thing, of course, is Tunis was the first major Allied city to be liberated. Um, you know, if you if if you don't count Stalingrad, because the irony is, of course, is that uh, 
Tunis is as big a victory as Stalingrad is. And in fact, some Germans rather scathingly dubbed it Tunisgrad because they felt trapped, you know, because they weren't allowed to evacuate. Um, and yet it's Stalingrad that's gone down in this sort of, you know, historical mythology of being this titanic battle, this war of wills between Hitler and Stalin over whether the city on the Volgograd would fall. And of course, the, the Russian Red Army victory there is seen as this turning point. Uh, and of course, the Germans surrendered in, in February uh, 43. I was speaking to Robert Lyman, the historian, about the Burma campaign a few months ago, and he was stressing the fact how, the, 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 you know, in the British Army over there considered itself the Forgotten Army because they were at such a distance from Britain and the people didn't maybe understand the terrain or the complexities of the fighting and the tactics and so on. Does a similar explanation hold for North Africa or was North Africa very much in the people's consciences back in in Great Britain, were people following this, or did it not quite make as much sense as maybe um, the European theatre of, of the conflict? I don't know. What do you think? No, I mean uh, uh, the population of Britain followed the fighting in North Africa very closely because it was the only point that we were directly involved, obviously fighting uh, the Germans and the Italians. Um, and as I say, I obviously mentioned some war correspondence there. It was very, very thoroughly covered. Um, you know, the British press. So they, they followed it very closely. I mean, obviously, Al- Al-Alamein was celebrated as a major victory, as it quietly ro- rightly was, and seen as the turning point in, in North Africa. And I'm, I'm going from memory here. I think the church bells were actually authorised to ring, you know, because it was such a deci- considered such a decisive victory. So, yes, um, it, the war was very closely followed here. Uh, and, of course, you know, the 8th Army were known as the Desert Rats, um, you know, 7th Armoured Division. So they, they kind of had entered the the public psyche, if you like, is this 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 brave band of warriors, uh, you know, very much like Burma, fighting in a very alien and hostile environment. And of course, there's this tendency to think of North Africa purely in in desert, but of course, actually, uh, you know, it is green in lush and places. It does have mountains because, of course, the fighting in Tunisia was was very much uh, in mountainous terrain. Uh, bits of Libya, of course, are quite mountainous as well. But but of course the popular perception was they were just out in the desert but there were lots of different climactic conditions they had to fight in of course during the day particularly in the summer it was bakingly hot so all of these um, elements lead to what happened in early may in tunis let's move on um we're going to move a little bit forward into the future a few weeks where we're going to go for our second scene please um, we're going to go 1st of june 1943 uh to the ancient amphitheater at carthage uh, and Churchill, quite understandably, was very, very keen to share uh, in the Allied victory in North Africa and to thank uh, the troops. And after the Germans obviously been had all surrendered, they'd been rounded up, disarmed, um, and it was deemed safe, he flew out to Tunis uh, to meet with members of the British First Army, which is, um, they'd been fighting in, in northern Tunisia. And 3,000 men were gathered in, uh, in the amphitheatre at Carthage, to listen to him make a speech and to thank them for all their efforts. And also, I think, to thank members of the 8th Army, of course, who've been fighting in North Africa since the very beginning. Uh, and Alan Wicker, who was, a, as a, I mentioned earlier, was a lieutenant in the Army Photographic Film Unit, he and his colleagues, because this was quite a momentous occasion, they had been told to record this for history. You know, the Prime Minister was going to address the troops. Uh, they needed images, obviously, for, the, for press outlets. They needed newsreel for the cinemas to show the public. So a, a cameraman with a cine camera was placed up in the amphitheatre behind where Churchill was going to stand. And photographers were placed on the wings so they could shoot the crowd. And Alan Wicker drew the short straw and he was told to place himself in front of the prime minister to get some good shots of the PM, you know, during his speech. So Churchill appears, goes to a little table they built. And, you know, it's nothing fancy. And the crowd went wild. They started cheering and clapping, you know, and welcoming him. And I think Churchill for a moment was a bit taken aback. And he spotted Alan Wicker sort of down in the orchestra pit, if you like, and looked to Wicker and went, not me, film them, pointing at the crowd. Because Paul Wicker was under orders to photograph the prime minister. This is a historic moment. So Wicker sort of hesitated because he's thinking, that's not my job. You know, we've got cameramen either side and behind him. You know, the cameraman behind is filming the crowd. The guys at the front are filming the crowd. It's up to me to get some nice portrait shots of the PM. So he hesitated. So, of course, the Prime Minister then gets slightly annoyed because he's used to people doing what, what they're told when he asked them to. So he says, you know, shoot them, shoot them. And again, Wicker hesitated. Hesitate. So at that point, General Anderson, who's commander of the, of the British First Army, steps forward and looks rather 
scowling at poor Wicker and says, you know, shoot them. So Wicker dutifully turns around with his stills camera and proceeds to take photographs of the cheering crowd, knowing actually that's not what he's supposed to be doing. And it wasn't until about halfway through Churchill's speech that Wicker felt plucked up enough courage to turn around and take photographs of the Prime Minister doing what he was supposed to be doing. And he subsequently caught him a bit later because when, after Churchill had made his speech and the crowd had calmed down and he thanked them all for the, you know, all, their, all their toil and blood, sweat and tears and what have you, went back to his car, followed by many of the troops. And he turned to face the troops and lifted his cane up with his sun helmet and waved it, jiggled it at them. Uh, and Wicker caught this uh, as a nice photograph, which has subsequently been you know, quite famous and is quite often reproduced. Um, so I just think it's this lovely story of this, you know, this one man, <laughs> one man caught up in this historical moment with Churchill come to celebrate uh, the Allied victory in North Africa, uh, you know, with 3,000 you know, men and officers. And, and in a way, actually, I think showed Churchill in quite a good light because actually he wanted the men caught for prosperity rather than him. And I think maybe that, that you know, I think that shows him it's in a the kind of comic mind. dilemma, isn't it, that you're describing, which lies at the heart of this bigger story. It's, in, it's It is quite vivid and it catches Churchill. He's the character we should probably take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about um, at this point. Um, as you say, he does, he does come across well as someone who's thinking um, about putting, putting the focus on the troops who've achieved the victory but it, it is again i mean he was often accused of grandstanding especially in his younger life when he would often exceed his orders and he wanted to you know he you know he'd, he would often find himself in situations that he just wasn't simply supposed to be in and so i suppose it's nice in this scene as well that we catch a little bit of churchill going to the center again which seems to be where he was happiest but it's not. I would, wouldn't strike me as a particularly easy thing to do to trans um, to transport the prime minister of Great Britain to North Africa in the middle of a, <laughs> in the middle of a war. But you can imagine that it was absolutely something he wasn't going to miss. Is that right? Yes. I mean, um, you know, it's a well-known fact that Churchill travelled an inordinate amount of um, time during the Second World War. I mean, he conducted this huge range of shuttle diplomacy, he visited the troops. Um, and a lot of it, I mean, I, the feeling I got from the book was actually he was a thwarted general. If he'd stuck with his military career, I could, I could almost imagine him being, you know, like Montgomery. He could have become a famous general. And I think if it hadn't been for his urge for a political career, I, I think he would have he would have stuck with it. But when he was younger, I mean, he was the most appalling adrenaline junkie. I mean, you know, he was this this danger seeker that he... He, he and again it stuck with him in later life that he was he was called to the sound of the drums always all the time you know the sound of the cannon he was a bit like a moth drawn to the flame that even when he was prime minister he was always desperate to be in the in the center of the action i mean it used to drive his advisors and his generals mad you know it's this, the, the famous story which i mentioned in the book of him and the king concocting this almost schoolboy like plan to get themselves on a british destroyer during d day so they could watch the bombardment and the troops going in, you know, um, and and you could understand why he'd want to do that. I mean, by that stage, he's an established historian, so he had his eye on history. And it, but he, but he, you know, he he wanted to lead from the front. So he and the king were going to go, and of course, the king's advisers and you know the, the government were aghast at this. The king was told, you know, they were both told, well, we can't have the reigning monarch and the head of you know and the head of British government on the same boat, what happens if, if the boats hit, you know, it's a public relations disaster and a propaganda coup for Hitler. So they were persuaded not to go much to um, Churchill's irritation. But but he, he you're right. I mean, he did take chances. Uh, he was always at risk of being shot down. I mean, that was something I, I again, I, I mentioned in the book is during the early days in, in 1940, just after he'd taken office and he was trying to bolster French morale. So he was flying over to Paris on, on a regular basis and on one occasion he was told that the weather was too bad for his fighter escort to escort his transport plane back to Britain. And Churchill being Churchill was impatient to get home, so he told the pilot to fly anyway. And they're halfway across the channel when the pilot looked down and he could see some enemy Messerschmitts uh, attacking a trawler. And luckily none of those Luftwaffe pilots looked up because if they had, they would have seen this fairly slow-moving transport aircraft heading towards Britain. And if they'd risen up and attacked it and shot it down, we would have lost Churchill. Uh, luckily, I'd say they were preoccupied shooting of 
a trawler and by the time they almost got to Dover the RAF put up some planes and they were safely escorted back into British airspace and back onto the ground but again it, it was the measure of the man I mean he was he was a risk taker he took inordinate risks with his own personal safety. You spoke right at the beginning this idea that he had of you know the walking with destiny that everything in his life had been an apprenticeship up to the you know, the moment that he was called to become prime minister in 1940. But equally, there's that sense of him believing in his own invincibility. Even if you go back, there's quite, again, this is, could be connected in a, in a comic sense with um, the, the, the scene in um, in Carthage, with him during his short time in the trenches in World War One, when he, I think you describe him gambling around like a young elephant at one point um, <laughs> in no man's land. This is staggering behaviour to everybody else who's in the company of troops in the trenches. But here comes this person who was not long, you know, kind of before a really important politician, perhaps one of the top, you know, most powerful people in the country, um, exposing himself to, to massive risks. And it is... I just can't think of an equivalent in in political history um, or recent political history, at least, of course, if you go back, um, there probably was. But it's it's an almost old fashioned um, idea of I don't know what it is, if it's noblesse oblige or whatever. The, this idea that he's got to be there with people, that he um, has a, a kind of moral duty to be involved in the action, which is, again, I suppose it's nice that we have him here in this in this context, you know, in, in a place that was so important in the ancient world and, you know, the connections with the Romans and, and you know, the, the Carthaginians and all the rest of it. So that does all make for a wonderful scene and we'll keep going, I think. Um, maybe one more question on Churchill, actually, before we go. I just wanted to ask if this really was a bit of a high point. If we were looking up at Churchill as he was making that speech, say we were with one of the war correspondents, we have all of the... Um, events of 1940 behind us. He's risen to this prominent position as a defender of the nation in, in, in the nation's um, psychology. Almost Churchill at his best that we're looking at before maybe anything's gone particularly wrong for him. What do you think? Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. I mean, you know, up until 1943, Churchill had made loads of mistakes. He'd made them over Greece, Crete, um, you know, North Africa, his constant assist, insistence on attacking Rommel when his generals weren't ready and are suffering the consequences. But nonetheless, he was always in the driving seat. Um, and as we discussed earlier, of course, the thing thing with 1943 is that the Mediterranean first strategy was very much in the fore. So I think you're right. Uh, Churchill pretty much is at the height of his political and military power in 1943. One of the things that struck me in the book was it was very much clear by the following year that he he's, his position as preeminent warlord, if you like, for the Allies was slipping because of Stalin's insistence that the Second Front be open. You know, I mean, they'd gone from 42, 43 to 44. Uh, you know, in the meantime, the Red Army is suffering most appalling bloodletting on the Eastern Front and doing the lion's share of of the work so you can understand why Stalin was annoyed that the Allies are seem to be mucking around on the periphery in the Mediterranean rather than you know striking in France and therefore towards Nazi Germany which would be a more direct route of, of you know drawing um, German divisions away from the Eastern Front. So it's sort of at that point that Churchill's overall direction of the war begins to wane um, and the key thing with that is Italy and obviously in 43 the Allies defeat the Axis in, in Tunisia they land in Sicily this causes a political crisis in Italy. Um, you know, Mussolini's arrested and falls from power. The Italians decide to swap um, sides. But the Allies acted slightly too slowly. So in the case of Sicily, a big chunk of the German-Italian troops escaped across the Straits of Messina to fight another day. And also while the Allies, while Patton and Montgomery obviously were conducting their campaigns to capture, you know, Palermo and Catina and, and Messina, while they were preoccupied, Hitler hatched this plan to seize northern Italy where he would hold the Allies at bay once they landed on the Italian mainland, which is indeed what, what happened. Churchill became obsessed with the idea that Italy somehow was the soft underbelly of Europe and that they could strike up through uh, Italy into Austria and on up to Berlin and, and that would hasten the end of the war. And you just have to look at the geography in Italy to go, well, that was, you know, that was never going to be the case. The, there's a spine of mountains that runs the entire length of Italy. So ideal for defensive warfare, which, of course, is what what's, what happened. 
But for some reason or other, Churchill remained wed to the campaign in, in Italy, even when it wasn't going well. I mean, you know, it wasn't until just before D-Day um, that Rome was captured. So the campaign in Italy was very, very, very slow. But the turning point for me, for Churchill, came pretty much two months after D-Day. Um, and by, all, by, by mid-August, the Germans were in headlong flight from Normandy, heading towards the Seine. Uh, Roosevelt and Churchill had given Stalin an undertaking that there would be two attacks on France. So there was a subsidiary uh, D-Day on the French Riviera. Now, bearing in mind, of course, divisions had been drawn from Italy to support the landings in Normandy, because obviously they needed the troops. And the same thing happened with the Riviera landings. They had to draw troops out of Italy, thereby weakening the Allied war effort in Italy. For the landings on the Riviera, and um, Churchill was so opposed to these landings that he actually threatened to resign. And, you know, he, he went to Eisenhower and said, you know, let's call it off. Don't do it. You know, or I'm going to resign and I'll bring the British government down. Um, and Roosevelt, over the diplomat, said, well, look, you and Roos you, sorry, Eisenhower said, look, you and Roosevelt, uh, agreed with Stalin that there would be a secondary landing in France. We can't back out of that now. Plus, the plan is so advanced and everything's in chain. We can't do anything. So I think it, that at that point, it's 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 only August forty four that Churchill's influence on on the Second World War has by that stage began to wane. <laughs> Hi there, it's Peter here. Unseenhistories.com is now three months old and already it is packed full of enticing, illuminating and excellently presented historical material. If you give the site a visit today, you'll see many beautifully illustrated excerpts of books that we've featured on Travels Through Time. There's excerpts from Malcolm Gaskell's Ruin of All Witches, Nigel Pickford's Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester and Gary Shaw's Egyptian mythology, along with many others as well. For those of you who like maps, you might want to check out the utterly compelling series of pieces on the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. That was a crucial moment in the American Civil War, along with a range of fabulously colourised images from Jordan Lloyd. It really is history for our times. Unseenhistories.com so nice to catch him at this moment in 1943 when he really is, I suppose, a symbol of the um, anti-Hitler war effort, I suppose, the best way to put it. Or maybe there's a better way to put it, if you like. But <laughs> but let's, um, let's, let's leave that behind, as fascinating as it is, and look at the third scene that you'd like to take us to. And this is the 17th of August in 1943. So what we're looking... I don't know, a couple of months after the speech in Carthage. What's happened by now? What's going on? Well, obviously, once the um, Allies had cleared the Axis forces out of North Africa, they had to decide where they were going to go next. You know, um, almost, if you like, the world was their oyster. They could have landed in the south of France. They could attack Sicily. They could attack the Italian mainland. They could land in the Balkans somewhere, maybe attack Greece. But of course, most of those plans were quite ambitious um, and they required quite a major sea lift. So in a way, the Allies, I think, took the right decision. They decided that they would secure Sicily first, because obviously if they conquered Sicily, that effectively gave them complete control of the Mediterranean. Sicily is the next, if you like, major landmass um, from Tunisia. Um, you know, it sits very firmly in the way, if you like, if you're, if you're crossing the Med. So the Allies decided, I think, that Sicily would make a good um, springboard for subsequent attacks elsewhere in the Med. But what it would also, of course, would, it would neutralise the Italian Air Force and the Luftwaffe operating on the island. They couldn't use it as an airbase anymore, which they had um, throughout the war. So it was decided to attack um, Sicily using British and American forces. And the idea was that General Patton would sort of push up um, the west coast and then along the northern coast uh, while Montgomery struck uh, in the sort of southeast and then pushed up the eastern coast with them meeting at Messina which is the major city and port which obviously faces the base of Italy but again because that invasion did not take place it took you know it took time didn't take place immediately after the German and Italian capitulation in North Africa it meant that the Germans had time to react. So the few units that had been withdrawn from North Africa were re-equipped. And also Hitler rushed two divisions onto Sicily. Uh, there were also something like 100,000 Italian troops on the island as well. Uh, although, to be fair, they were not of very good quality. They were sort of static coastal defence units, so they weren't very mobile. But Hitler stuck in a um, German parachute division, so highly flexible 
uh, unit, and likewise a Panzer, Panzer Grenadier division, which is highly mobile. So the Allies kind of found actually what they were hoping would be a, a fairly easy takeover of Sicily, turned into a bit of a slog. And it turned in memorably into a race between Patton and Montgomery, who were desperate to get to Messina first, because if they got to Messina, that obviously cuts off all the Axis forces on the island, uh, sealed the island off, and it meant effectively it was in Allied hands. But for Montgomery, uh, he had the slight problem that sitting in his way was uh, Mount Etna, you know, volcano, which the Germans dug in around. Ideal defensive position. It also overlooked the Katina Plain. So, of course, the Allies covering that were shot at from German artillery uh, and what have you that was on Mount Etna. So they, they, it turned into a bit of a slogging match. And in a way, a slight embarrassment as well when you consider the quality of the troops, aside from the German ones. Um, so it took them, you know, I suppose, what, six weeks or so to overwhelm the garrison, which you say is quite quick. But the problem with that was... 100,000 Axis troops escaped across the Straits of Messina. The Allies never, ever sealed them. They, they did, you know, again, like the sort of Rommel's land based Dunkirk, um, the Italians and the Germans actually conducted a seaborne Dunkirk from Messina over to, is it Regia, I think, the, the port opposite on the Italian mainland. They conducted this very, very successful uh, evacuation using, you know, uh, train ferries, uh, passenger ferries, landing craft, anything, you know power boats, yachts, anything they could get their hands on. So they evacuated a lot of the troops and equipment, which of course then ended up in mainland Italy, ready to resist subsequent invasion of there. But I always thought it would have been really, really interesting. Um, the Americans got to Messina on the 17th of August, and they got there before Monty. I mean, Patton picked him to the post, much to Monty's irritation as the Americans got there, got there first. And again, it must have been that sort of sense of celebration and euphoria as they steamed into into this city and of course it's worth remembering that a lot of Sicilians actually view themselves as separate from mainland Italy you know they tend to be Sicilian first and Italian second and indeed of course you know it's well known that the Americans made use of the Sicilian mafia to to help them take over the island you know they fed them uh, intelligence and helped some of the locals cooperate so there was sort for a lot of the Sicilians there was sort of a mixed blessing in that they you know they almost felt that they'd been liberated from fascist Italian rule uh, which is not to say of course a lot of Sicilians were were loyal supporters of Mussolini so the, you know it was this sense of what it must have been like when they got into Messina the port there was a complete mess because obviously the Germans had blown up any remaining supplies ammunition fuel the harbour was full of boats that had been sunk. Uh, by this point, of course, the Allied air forces were beginning to operate over the straits. I mean, that was one of the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the failures is that Royal Navy, the US Navy, and indeed the Allied air forces had not been able, able to operate over the straits because they were very, very, very hesitant of losses because of the sheer density of anti-aircraft artillery that the Italians and Germans managed to muster both sides of um the straits. I mean, they created, you know, a flak alley, if you like, that they just put up this barrage of hot metal every time anything came anywhere near it. So they successfully defended um, the crossing. You know, they kept it by the air forces and the navy, which enabled them to escape. So when they got into Messina, you know, they they kind of were not entirely aware of what what the Italians and Germans had done. Uh, you know, the mess. But again, there was that sense of another victory for the Allies. You know, they'd taken Tunis, they'd now taken Messina. Uh, and they and they struck a mortal blow against the Italians. The Italians were in a terrible state because, of course, they'd lost an army on the Eastern Front, courtesy of Stalingrad. Uh, they'd lost two or three armies in North Africa, courtesy of you know, Tunisia. They had a couple of armies tied down in the Balkans because, obviously, they were operating in, in uh, Albania and, and Greece. Uh, and they effectively only had an army left to oversee the defence of southern Italy and Sicily. So they were in a right old terrible state you know that they they expended much of their manpower and all their better units um which of course as i say resulted in this political crisis in italy when the italians started to think it's time to get out of the war you know we've made a mistake we've backed the wrong side is this a sense which is creeping across to britain coming out in the newspapers of people feeling more optimistic or is there still a sense that the war has as indeed it does have another nearly two years to go no, I think I think even then people recognised that 1943 was the decisive year that the tide was 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 firmly turning in their favour. Of course, Hitler was still left controlling much of continental Europe. Uh, you know, he was despite uh, his defeats at um, Stalingrad and of course Kursk in the summer of 43, Hitler was still far from defeated. So there was that sense of 
what do we do next? Uh, and in a way, of course, the Allied landings in Sicily greatly helped the Russians because Hitler called off his, his offensive at Kursk because he needed to divert troops to Italy to bolster Italy. Uh, so it slowed down German momentum on the Eastern Front. So it did help Stalin, you know, t- to some extent. And I, and I think I mentioned earlier, the one thing that Hitler did very, very swiftly was he took over northern Italy. Um, the Italians were left in a bit of a quandary because they didn't quite know what to do. They asked the Allies, you know, for an armistice. They wanted to, to, to effectively surrender, if you like, to the Allies. And I think if the Allies had landed north of Rome next, the Italian army would have taken on the limited number of German troops there. Rome would have been taken by the Allies and the German takeover of northern Italy would probably have not gone as well as it did. But of course, instead, they landed to the south. The Germans were able to disarm much of the Italian army very, very quickly. Uh, they got troops across the Brenner Pass, you know, the main, main mountain pass into northern Italy. The Italian troops in northern Italy were not quite sure what they were supposed to be doing, because, of course, previously they'd been allies with the Germans. So there was that um, sense of, you know, do we fight? Uh, do we lay down our arms? Uh, what, do, what are we supposed to be doing? And, of course, there was that sort of military political vacuum in Italy uh, that, that Hitler and particularly Rommel and Kesselring were able to take advantage of because they very, very quickly shored up the situation in Italy, which could have actually been quite disastrous uh, for Hitler. And as for Churchill himself, was there any sign of him turning up in Sicily or was that for him one maybe geography too far? Maybe it was a bit too dangerous. <laughs> knowing, I mean, knowing Churchill, he probably would have loved to have done that. I suspect he was advised against it because, of course, it's an Italian, you know, an Italian island. Uh, and trying to guarantee his safety there probably would have would have been a bit of a nightmare. Um, he, I mean, you know, he was notorious for losing his temper, uh, getting annoyed and acting petulant if he if he didn't didn't get his own way. I mean, an example of that, which again I chronicle in the book, is is you know, 1945, the Rhine crossing that Churchill had made it adamantly clear to Paul Montgomery that he was going to take part. You know, and you just go well. Can you imagine Boris Johnson high telling it to the I don't know, you, the Ukraine or Afghanistan or Iraq? You know, to be with the troops during fight. It's it's not what a head of state does, is it? But, the, the the film footage where he's smoking a cigar as he's being kind of motored across the yeah, Rhine yes. is that yes. the one? Yeah, yeah. And and initially he told Montgomery that he wanted to be involved. He wanted to be in a tank in this second assault wave over the river. And I mean, again, you know. Poor Montgomery had better things to do. I mean, he'd under sufferance, he'd hosted Churchill in Normandy after the Normandy landings, because obviously having said that he couldn't go on a destroyer, uh, they had to host him. I'm going from memory here. I think it was sort of like 10th of June. So literally four days after the landings, he got himself over to Normandy. You know, there's, there's poor old Montgomery trying to fight a military operation and he's got VIPs turning up in his midst. It just came looping back um, maybe for a final question about this, um, this invasion of Sicily or, or the crossing of the Mediterranean. Again, if we think of the idea of the apprenticeship, the man like kind of of destiny that Ch- Churchill considered himself to be, he was um, most famously, I suppose, in his younger life involved in that Gallipoli campaign in the Dardanelles. That, that's right, isn't it? And he, he learned things from, I mean, the geography is different, but there are similarities between the idea of attacking an exposed coastline like that. And you, I suppose, make make the argument in the book that he he decided from then on that you were never to plan these things by committee. They were to be the idea of one person to be executed by one person very strongly. Do you see any of that experience being um, carried forward into something like the Sicily campaign, for example? Uh, yes, I mean, very much so. Um, you know, as I've said, the... the, the Mediterranean first uh, strategy was 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 very much his. You know, he was in the driving seat. His vision was to clear the axis from the Med, and uh, and and that's what they did. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think Churchill foremost saw himself as a warlord. I mean, I think if he was alive today, and we we asked him and said, you know, were you a political leader or you were a warlord? I'm sure he would say he was both. And of course, that's one of the reasons why I called the book Master and Commander because. Um, he he made himself where he became Britain's political master, but also its military commander. And and he did that by appointing himself as defence minister. It's the first time the country had had that post. And he did that deliberately because it gave him strategic oversight of the Second World War. So effectively cut out Secretary of State for war. It meant the chiefs of staff answered directly to him in his role as defence minister and obviously would also answer to him 
in his role as prime minister. So he, he fused these two roles, you know, political and military leader, to make himself very much a warlord. And I and I firmly think that was born of his experiences, uh, you know, in places like South Africa where he'd witnessed the Boer War and he'd seen what a shambles the British Army had been there and trying to, you know, defeat a handful of, you know, South African farmers with Mauser rifles on ponies, you know, the, the, the Boers had run circles around the, the British Army for a number of years and the only way we'd won was sheer weight of numbers. Uh, you know, you, you touched on Gallipoli and again, you know, he, he'd seen what a shambles that was because there was no clear focus, um, you know, adequate resources had not been committed to the operation. There was no clear focus of how they were going to do it, what the ultimate goal of the operation was, uh, and the whole thing was a shambles. And of course, you know, he was blamed for Gallipoli and that and that haunted him forever after. I think, you know, certainly during the Second World War, you know, come D-Day, he started getting cold feet. You know, he began to be a nuisance with Eisenhower because he had this vision of the beaches being soaked in blood uh, because he'd seen what had happened at Gallipoli where it, it had all gone wrong. Now, obviously, to be fair, First World War and Second World War are completely different beasts because, of course, warfare had become so much more mobile by the by the 1940s. But but those experiences haunted him, and and certainly you're right, they shaped his they shaped his leadership, and they also shaped what he felt was achievable and what was possible and how it should be done. I was interested by the stories from the memoirs of his his commanders. You know, people like Harris and. Um, Alan Brooke and you know all those people and Wavell and they all found that quite often they would give advice to Churchill but he'd already made his mind up uh, you know he was notorious for inviting people to checkers late at night and they'd have a late dinner and have a bit of a chat and you know discuss the, the war and then go and watch a movie because he was very much a night bird and would sleep till late in the morning whereas of course if you're in charge of bomber command or you know, CNC Home Forces or CNC RAF, you've got to go back to the war in the morning. But so he, he would keep his commanders up late at night, which they didn't like much. But also they would give him advice and then quite often he 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 didn't seem to heed it because he'd already decided, you know, this was a course of action that they were going to take. And I suspect on many occasions he felt the advice his commanders were often excuses for not doing something. You know, I think his view was that they were there to execute um, you know the orders of the political leadership and they needed to go and get on with it so he he certainly trod on a lot of toes you know as a result of that that way of leading yeah th- this is hopefully giving people a real great flavor of the book which is really expansive i mean it covers 50 years there's a lot in there and a lot of what we've been talking about is kind of you know is obviously in there in greater detail as well there's this picture of Churchill being the um, the commander of many guises, I like the idea of him turning up in all these different uniforms that you point out early on. And there's this kind of intellectual curiosity of his as well, which might be shown through his interest in developing tanks during the First World War, or perhaps even through his um, friendship with someone like H.G. Wells, the writer, which is another like kind of running theme for us. It's really um, recommended for people who are interested interested in the military history of the first um, half of the 20th century, because after all, that is Churchill, basically. He is that expansive that he, in a way, is um, a biography to the times as, as much um, as his own kind of person. We're going to end this episode, though, as we always do, with a little bit of material history, and I, it means I give you the opportunity to, um, metaphorically at least, to bring back a memento from the year 1943, which you've already pointed out for its significance already. But is there any like tangible object that you would like to have at home, maybe in your writing room, to remind you of the events of 1943? Something that symbolised the time. Yeah, uh, yes, there is. I would, I would bring back Churchill's sun helmet from his his trip to Carthage. You know, it's one of those old style army pith helmets that they they used to wear. I'd keep that because. A Churchill wore it, but also it, it summed up the fighting in North Africa. You know the the climactic conditions that they they fought in. I, yeah, I think that would be quite a good souvenir. Yeah, be a, be a good thing to have in this stormy weather as well. Maybe you could put it on in in North <laughs> Devon and to protect you in case of any strange gusts. Well, Anthony Tucker Jones, author of Churchill, Master and Commander, it's been a complete pleasure today. I've learned a lot. I think we've established that 1943, as this year, right in the middle of. World War II is one of absolute significance. And for that, I have to thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.
That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Anthony Tucker-Jones about the year 1943 and his new book, Winston Churchill, Master and Commander, which has recently been published by Osprey. You can read more about this as ever on our website, tttpodcast.com. A few snippets of news for you today. Later on this week, we'll be publishing an extra episode with the author Nadine Ackerman on one of history's most misunderstood queens. Elizabeth Stewart. Look out for that one. Also, some cheerful news. This week we've been selected by The Guardian as one of their top podcast picks. It's a great thing for us and a prompt for me to say thank you all very much for listening. Till next time, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>